In this segment, we look at basic dynamic allocation of memory in C. It's a concept we'll use heavily in lectures to come. Up to this point, all the variables we've used have been declared specifically. Our program starts with a declared set of variables, and those are all we get. But it's not always possible to know in advance just how much data a program will need. And more sophisticated programs often need to, in effect, create new variables while they run to accommodate data as they get it. As a simple example, when we declare a character array to hold a string, we must declare it to be a certain size, and thus strings larger than that size, less one for the null, will not fit, and smaller strings will waste part of the space. Being able to create an array of just the right size while the program runs would fix this. A brief aside here, by the way, you may be aware that C99 compilers will let you declare an array using a variable instead of a constant, which variable you can set during the program run, adjusting the size of the array. The C99 standard is not universally used, however, and its variable-sized arrays have limitations. The C99 feature partially automates a standard method for creating variable-sized blocks, which we'll learn in the next lecture segments. You'll be expected to use this old-fashioned quote-unquote approach in the class and in most industrial development teams as well. So, C reserves a large block of memory called the runtime heap, which I've sort of drawn up here in abstract form, for the purpose of creating new variables as the program runs. There are no variables in this area of memory when the program starts. It's just uninitialized space but you can create new variables from it while the program runs, reserving space in the runtime heap for your variables. And this is called dynamic allocation. Now, dynamically allocated variables have no name. We generally can't predict how many we'll need, and so we cannot plan names in advance. Instead, we use pointers to access them, which is why we've had to wait till now to even talk about this idea. Look at line 8 and 9 of our sample code here. Here we have a double pointer PD and an int pointer PI. And they're initialized not by assigning the address of an existing variable into them, but instead by dynamically allocating, creating from the runtime heap two nameless variables for them to point to. You create new variables from the runtime heap by calling the malloc library function, which is available, by the way, if you pound include standard lib.h malloc is one of the most important library functions in C, and a typical industrial C program will include hundreds or thousands of malloc calls. malloc has one parameter, the number of bytes of runtime heap storage you want to reserve for your new variable. You want a number of bytes just right for the type of variable you're creating. The best way to determine this is with a size of operation, as we do in the code here, asking for a size of double for a double variable and a size of int for an int. Now, malloc looks in the runtime heap for an unused space of the size you requested, and it marks it as reserved space. And we'll look at how it marks it, quote-unquote, in an upcoming lecture, but for now, just take it on faith. It returns the address of that space. And typically, then, you assign the returned address into a pointer, as we do on lines 8 and 9. So, a picture of that here. We now have PD and PI pointing to a double and an int, respectively, that were created out of the runtime heap. From then on, you use the space by dereferencing the pointers. Since the space is otherwise nameless, the pointer is the only way to get to it. You must have pointers in order to have dynamically allocated variables. Now, question one here. It looks like whatever type it is that malloc returns, it can be assigned without casting into a double pointer or an int pointer and as we'll see to any other type of pointer also. So, what type does malloc return? And, uh, coming back from a pause, malloc must return a void pointer. It's the only fully generic pointer type. And it's our job to assign that void pointer, void pointer return value into the right type of pointer so that the target will be treated as the right type of variable. Now, the output from line 10 shows the actual addresses from the runtime heap that malloc returned. The uh, runtime heap in this case, looking at the output, is obviously at a fairly high area in memory, since those addresses are a little over 2 billion, 
but the location of the heap is not really predictable. We just trust mALloc to manage it correctly. Now on lines 12 and 13, we pass the address of our dynamically allocated variables to scanf to get values entered into them, apparently a 1.2 and a 3 if you look at the uh, sample run. And then uh, on the next line we dereference the pointers to uh, compute and print the sum of the two values. The dynamically allocated variables are just as usable as any other integer or double. Memory space is memory space. You just have to get to them through the pointers. And by the way, of course, we would need to be sure the starting addresses are aligned properly in memory. Recall our earlier discussion on bus errors. And mALloc does ensure proper alignment. It always returns an address divisible by 4 or 8 uh, as needed. Now, so far, this is nothing we couldn't have done with a couple of ordinary variables. What dynamic allocation gives you that ordinary variables do not is what we might call variables on demand. You can create as many new variables as you like, subject only to runtime heap memory limits. And they may be of any type. In later modules, we'll do a lot of this. But for now, the loop on lines 15 through 18 illustrates the basic principle. This loop here executes three times. And it creates a new double pointed to by PD on each iteration. Look at the output lines below. And you can see that PD points to a new address on each iteration. Right down in here. In fact, if you look closely, the address in PD advances by 16 bytes each time as M. Malik chooses the next available spot in the runtime heap. Now, we'll see later that even if you ask for, say, 8 bytes to hold a double, mALloc returns a little more than you requested for housekeeping reasons, thus those 16-byte jumps. And again, more on that later. Now, the loop stops after three iterations to keep the output reasonable, but nothing would have prevented it from running a thousand or even a million times. We can make as many doubles or any other type of variable as we have room for in the runtime heap. But there is something wrong with that loop. The only way to get to allocated storage is via a pointer. But we're changing PD to point to a new double on each iteration, and thus we're losing track of the prior allocated variable each time. Drawing a picture up here, it's as if we're doing the following. We get that after the first iteration, and then uh, after the next iteration, we're doing this, and so on down the line. With the older values all being forgotten. This illustrates an important point about dynamic allocation. Keep a pointer to your allocated variable or lose it. There's no way to find an allocated variable after you've lost the pointer to it. The lost variables in that loop not only cannot be used, their space in the runtime heap will be forever marked as reserved so that no other call of mALloc can make use of that space. The runtime heap is not of infinite size, so running the loop enough times would eventually fill the runtime heap with doubles that have been created by mALloc, <coughs> but which we can no longer access. And such variables are called dead storage. There is a way to avoid dead storage, which we'll look at in the next lecture segment.